in this short video, we're going to introduce functions of several variables. So up to this point, what kind of functions have we seen? Well, all the way up through calculus two, the functions that we were studying were functions of a single variable. You had one input and one output. So where we, if we write y equals f of x, x is our input, it is our independent variable and y is our output it's the dependent variable so something like y equals x squared and we just studied vector functions so functions where you have a scalar input t and then your outputs are the components of a vector which you maybe have two or three components so the t variable is your independent variable and x y and z are all independent variables and the graph of that is a space curve so in this chapter we want to look at a new type of function something we would write z equals f of x comma y so x comma y is inside the parentheses that's telling me both x and y in that order are my inputs. So I have an ordered pair, x comma y as the input and a single variable z as the output. So both x and y are independent variables. z is the dependent variable. And the graph is going to be a surface. Like some of the surfaces we've already seen like uh, an elliptic paraboloid. How would we calculate the domain? Well, it's very similar to what we've done in the past. We know that there are certain uh, operations that we cannot perform. I cannot take the square root or the an even root of a negative number, and I can't divide by zero. So if I want to find the domain of the function f of x comma y equals radical x squared minus y over x plus y, then that function will be defined provided that, well, I don't have a negative number under the radical, so x squared minus y must be greater than or equal to zero. And I'm not dividing by zero. So x plus y cannot equal zero. So I may want to clean up the condition where x squared minus y is greater than or equal to zero. It might be easier to think of that as being y is less than or equal to x squared. And then I can use set builder notation to describe the domain. So let's review set builder notation. With set builder notation, everything is surrounded by an open brace and then a closed brace. We talk about first, or we make note first, what objects or variables comprise the objects in the set. And so that's why I say I'm going to have ordered pairs in this set. This set is going to describe a region in the xy plane. So I'm going to have ordered pairs, x comma y. And remember this pipe or bar here, we say is such that, and then I write down the conditions. So y is less than x squared and x plus y cannot equal zero. In part B of this example, we'd like to sketch that domain because sometimes looking at it in set builder notation uh, is not as clear as we would like. So we have the two conditions. Y has to be less than X squared and less than or equal to X squared and X plus Y cannot equal zero. So that's going to give us a region in the XY plane. It's going to be the portion below the parabola y equals x squared 
and not on the line y equals negative x. So I've drawn a dashed line there to indicate that that line is not part of the domain. Let's sketch another domain for the function g of x comma y equals the natural log of 1 minus xy. So remember, the domain of a log function is only the positive numbers. You cannot take the log of 0, and you can't take the log of a negative number. So we have to have 1 minus xy, the input to the log function, has to be strictly greater than 0, which is equivalent to saying that x times y should be less than 1. So if I want to sketch the region x times y is less than 1, then I should think about the boundary. And the way I find the boundary is replace the inequality sign with an equal sign. So the boundary will be the parabola xy equals 1. I said not, not parabola, hyperbola xy equals 1. And I'll use a dashed line because I have strictly greater than. So whenever it equals 1, that's not part of the domain. So I've used a dashed line, sketched x times y equals 1. And now I've got to find out, well, which of the regions? Is it the region between the two branches, or is it the region outside of the two branches where my domain lies? I want x, y to be less than 1. Well, to help us, we can use a test point. So, for example, if I take 0, 0, and I ask myself, does this satisfy the inequality? With x equal to 0 and y equal to 0, will that be less than 1. And sure enough, that's true. So that tells me that the 0 comma 0 does belong to the region that I want, or does belong to the domain. So it must be the region between the hyper between the branches of the hyperbola. That's my domain. Well, we said earlier that the graph of a function of two variables is a surface. And specifically, it's an open surface. So it wouldn't be a sphere or an ellipsoid. Those are closed surfaces. It would have to be a surface where every ordered pair is paired exactly with one z value. That's what it would mean for it to be a function for every input there is exactly one output. So let's sketch the graph of f of x comma y equals 4 minus y minus 2x. To help us understand this, let's start by replacing the f of x comma y with z. So now I have the equation z equals 4 minus y minus 2x. And this is a familiar object. Its graph is familiar. We've studied that, but it will help if I rewrite it as 2x plus y plus z equals 4. And we should recognize that that is a plane. So we're going to sketch this plane. We're not going to be bothered with trying to find um, the normal vector uh, just to be able to sketch it. We're going to use the intercepts on the axes. So we're going to find out, OK, if I set a y and z equal to 0, what x value do I get? If I set x and z equal to 0, what y value do I get? And if I have x and y equal to 0, what z value do I get? And then I'll plot those points on the axes, connect them with the triangle, and shade the region between. And that is sufficient to represent the graph of that plane.
Let's sketch another surface. Here we have g of x comma y equals radical of 4 minus x squared minus y squared. And as we did before, we'll start by replacing the g of x comma y with z. Then I'm going to square both sides. And I'm going to see that, oh, I can rewrite that as x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. But I have to be careful here. Remember the radical symbol only represents the positive square root. So z is never negative. So when I write the equation in this form, I need to make a note that z is greater than or equal to 0. Well, without that part, this would be the equation of a sphere, but we know the equation of a sphere is a closed surface. It would not represent the graph of a function, but that's fine because really we only want the upper half. Now the upper half does represent the uh, graph of a function. And so it's radius, and here I'm using the Greek letter rho. The radius is two. So I went ahead and tried to sketch this uh, hemisphere. Uh, it's, it's very challenging, especially uh, when you're trying to use a tablet to do it. But um, technology gives us a clearer picture. So this is the upper hemisphere with centered at the origin with radius two. So, we know that sketching surfaces in 2D, even for simple objects like a hemisphere, can be challenging. So another technique we could use to help us visualize the uh, surface or the graph of a function is our level curves. And level curves are something like a contour map. How does a contour map work? Well, suppose you have some terrain and Imagine that you were to draw a line or make a path which has everywhere on the path the same elevation. And then you go up another, uh, in this case, I believe they go by 80 feet. You go another 80 feet and you make another path or draw another line which is exactly at the same elevation. And then you just continue to do that in increments of 80 feet. Then imagine that you look down from the top, look straight down, and you were to sketch the paths that you just drew. And so um, this is what you would look like. You'd see a bunch of uh, paths that don't intersect each other for the most part, um, but each line represents a different elevation. And you do have to label these. So the, this diagram that I got, I should have made a little improvement before putting it up here because having only one number doesn't tell you. You have no idea um, whether you're actually going down as you get towards these smaller curves or if you're going up. Now, we know from the, the other picture that we're actually going up. Now, notice that where the terrain or the surface is very steep, the contour lines are close together. And where the uh, surface is changing, let's just say in the Z direction, rather slowly, the contour lines are far apart or the level curves are far apart. And again, so here's a little bit better, than we, and this is how we can see that they're going by 80 feet. So it would be nice if they put more than one label here. So again, on this side, I have a very steep ascent or a steep slope. The level curves are close together, tightly packed. On this side, I'm going up with a more gentle slope or over here, a more gentle slope. The level curves are far apart. So how would we draw the level curves of a surface? 
z equals f of x, y. Well, we want to pick some values of k that are equally spaced. So it may make sense to use, you know, k equals, you know, negative 2 to positive 2. But you want to go from negative 2 to negative 1 to 0 to 1 to 2, equally spaced. If I choose my spacing to be 1 half, I could do k equals 0, 0 0.5, 1, 1.5. The choice of k is going to depend on the surface. And so you're going to have to think about, for example, what possible z values even make sense there. And you know which ones would be of interest. Usually zero is going to be one of them, um, but it really is going to depend on the surface that you look at. But once you've chosen your values of k, you're going to sketch f of x, y equals k. So that'll be a curve in the x, y plane. And then you're going to label that curve with your value for k. So for example, we have our hemisphere. So I'm going to choose values of k, which makes sense here. Um, remember, the radical is the positive square root. So it wouldn't make any sense for me to choose k values which are smaller than zero. So I'll start cho choosing the, the zero value. But then I can also see that um, really the largest that z can be is two. So the largest value for k is two. So I just want to divide that up into equal, equal increments from 0 to 2. So I chose 1 half. So I'm going to set my uh, f of x, y, my z value, or my elevation, my height of the surface, to be 0, then 1 half, then 1, 3 halves, and 2. And doing some uh, uh, algebra here, I can see that each one of those will give me an equation of a circle, except for the very last one. The only solution to x squared plus y squared equals 0 uh, is the origin, the 1 point 0 comma 0. So when I graph those, and I use some technology to help me here. This is Desmos helping me. Uh, I just get a set of concentric circles. And you can see, now I've labeled these, right? The z, I put z instead of k because really that is the height, right? I'm talking about, okay, at the very center of, uh, or at the origin, I know that the height of that surface is two units. And at the boundary of it, the outer boundary, the height is zero. And so on this first circle, the height is a half. On the brown circle, the height is one. And on this circle here, I'm not sure what color we want to call this, uh, mauve, it's the height is 3 halves or 1.5. So those correspond to my k values right there. And from what we know about a, a sphere, if we look down upon it, going from the very top and moving out, it starts out with a very shallow slope, but then as you get to the edges, the slope gets very steep, and that's why the uh, level curves now start to get very close together as you approach the edge. So let's look at the level curves for a hyperbolic paraboloid. Remember, this is a, a surface that has a saddle point, right? If I put y equal to zero, I get an upward opening z equals x squared plus one. If I put x equal to zero, I get a downward opening parabola z equals negative y squared plus one. So I'm going to choose some different values of k. Now here I could have z values, so replacing h of x comma y with the z, Z could be positive or it could be negative. So I'm just going to take a negative 2 up to positive 2 or maybe positive 3. 
And uh, I see that I'm going to get a collection of hyperbola. Now here, where the, I have a negative sign over here, I'm going to get a hyperbola, uh, which has intercepts on the y-axis. Uh, this x squared minus y squared equals zero is actually not a hyperbola. It's just the lines x equals positive y, x equals negative y. And then if I look at um, the, para, the, I'm sorry, the hyperbolas, where I have a positive value on the right-hand side, that tells me that I'm going to get hyperbolas that have intercepts on the x-axis. And I'm not sure what I just did there. If I can clean this up, I seem to have duplicated my y. There we go. All right, so uh, again, using some technology to help me draw that. Uh, I've got, uh, again, when my z, z value or my height is negative, I actually wind up or zero. So when the right-hand side winds up being negative, uh, I have a hyperbola. So two branches. I only labeled the upper branch, but there's a lower branch corresponding to each one of these. And the heights are negative two, negative one, and zero. And so as you go away from this is this part right here, the origin, right at the origin, as you go along the y-axis, you're actually going down in either direction. Right? And your height at the peak there is one. And then if you go again walking uh, in the y direction, positive y direction or the negative y direction, you're going down. And that makes sense. Remember, we saw when x is 0, you have negative y squared plus 1. On the other hand, as you go along the x-axis, you're actually going up. You're starting from 1, then you go to 2, 3, and 4. So right here at the origin is my saddle point. And so the surface looks something like this. As you um, remember, this is the y-axis here. So as you go along the y-axis, you're going down. And behind that, you don't see it, but you'll be going down. But starting from the uh, z equals 1 at the x comma y equals 0, then you, we, when you go along the x-axis, and again, this is the x-axis, you're going up. Now, we've only been talking about functions of two variables because we actually can imagine or sketch the graph of that uh, of a function of two variables. It's an object in 3D, and that's the where we live. We live in 3D. But if I have something like w equals a function of x, y, and z, the input is an ordered triplet, so you have three independent variables, x, y, and z, and you have one dependent variable, w. But its graph, well, for example, let's think of f of x comma y comma z being x squared plus y squared equals z squared, or maybe g of x comma y comma z being 2y e raised to the power of x z. The graph lives in 4d. You have three inputs, one output. It lives in four-dimensional space, which we cannot draw a sketch of in 3d. However, what we can do is we can think about uh, our level curves. There we were able to get some notion of visualizing the uh, graph by looking in a lower dimension. So looking at 2D graphs, I was able to imagine what the surface would look like in 3D. So I'm not saying that we can actually visualize 
what the surface is, but we can get some information about the surface, I mean, about the graph of, the, of this function, this four-dimensional object, by uh, looking at level surfaces. And it's the same idea as level curves. We're going to choose a value for k. And normally, you only choose one value of k. Uh, and you look at its graph, which will be a surface in 3D. Now, it doesn't have to be a surface uh, which represents a function, because this is just a level surface for our function. So an example would be, if I look at f of x comma y comma z is x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and say choose k equals to 1, my level surface now is the sphere. And it would be the whole sphere with radius 1. 